Okay, welcome everybody, and uh, thanks, Brian. I'm delighted to get the opportunity to speak to you all this evening. I, as uh, Brian mentioned, I am a member of the LCPA committee, <coughs> and I have been for a long time. I don't know, I, I'm sure some of you remember that I was chairman of the Lancer Society for a few years. That feels like a lifetime ago now. Um, it was a it was a fun time. It was exciting. It was a great way of pe meeting people. It was really to be recommended <coughs> highly. And anybody who who who's considering joining the committee, I, I would highly recommend it. So I don't know if you be if those of you who, who remember me um, probably know a little bit about my background. Most of you are probably new, newer to the society and don't remember me so well. Um, as I said, I was a, I think I joined the committee around about 2008, and I became chairman in 2010 and 2011. <coughs> um, so at that time, I was finance director for the company I was working in. I used what I thought was the top of my profession. I knew I was going to be happy when I got to the top. And then my lovely wife at the time was diagnosed with young onset Alzheimer's disease. So I found myself caring for my wife, anxious to make sure she got the best care possible, but also anxious to make sure that my own career could be maintained and my own life could be continued and everything I'd worked for to date, to that date, could be achieved. And it wasn't always easy. It took a lot of, a lot of work, particularly as Alzheimer's disease progressed and things became more challenging. But I worked through it and I did achieve a lot of my desires and goals. And to be honest, I had to change a lot of what I, I, I I thought about life at that time. So Helen moved into the nursing home, I think, in 2013. And not long after that, I started a new relationship. And we had two children. But the sad story of my life wasn't was at the beginning. I had a wife in a nursing home. I had two children. And then it took a family tragedy for things to change. One of my children died suddenly. And that was in 2018. It was a bit of a shock to the system. Um, my career had continued apace. It was really, really was challenging, it was stressful. As a lot of fears for senior accountants. Uh, and needless to say, that led me to reprioritize what I wanted. That led me to think about what I wanted from life. What was I doing all the work for? Why was I so stressed? And that's why I'm here. I've made it my mission to help others, like yourselves, high achieving executives, find the meaning and purpose that will help to find the balance and actions that will lead to greater happiness. That's, that's a cliche. What I'm here to say is, you don't have to wait for the tragedy to happen. You don't have to wait for the cliff to become the person you are meant to be. You can be a leader of your life, of your community, and most important, of yourself, right now, without changing anything as far as my mindset. So I'm going to let somebody else do, do a little bit of speaking just for a moment. <coughs> if I can start this video. Oh, 
Okay, so let's see if my videos aren't gonna work. Procrastinate plans. Okay, so you get to see how I respond to stress and anxiety. Basically, this is a, a guy called Vishen Lakhanich. He has influenced my career decisions enormously over the last number of years. He uh, he's American, as most people in this place are, and his message is. You don't have to be. You don't have to be subtle. You don't have to be easygoing. You can be forceful. You can be fierce. You can be a badass. And being a badass does not mean that you cannot at the same time be a Buddha. He quotes. He gives examples of Jesus Christ, who changed the world. He left an enormous legacy after him. People think that he's spiritually saintly, and he is all of those things, but he was also a badass. He shook up the world. He upset people. He didn't take kindly to people who he saw as not living to their, to their personal values and interests. So the message of this guy is, be a badass, but don't let that stop you from being a Buddha. In fact, it's important if you want to be a Buddha, if you want to be spiritual, if you want to have meaning, it's important to be a badass. Shake up the world, do what you need to do to, to get people's attention, to, to progress. So what do people see when they look at you? <coughs> well, I can only tell you how it was for me when I was at the top of my profession, when I was finance director of a company. I had looked at a company employees, up to 500 people at some stage. And what did people see when they saw me? They saw somebody who was hardworking and successful and professional, <coughs> but they also saw the badass. They didn't see the Buddha. In fact, some of them, I would go so far as they were a little bit afraid. And that impacted directly my ability to get my job done. People were afraid to say they did something wrong and covered mistakes. And for me, that was one thing I couldn't tolerate at the time. But that wasn't who I saw myself as being. I saw myself as being the Buddha. Too much the Buddha, not enough the badass. So I said about changing that. So if you don't like what you see, you can change it. Shatter that mirror that you see. Shatter that mirror that represents other people's opinions of you, because it really is meaningless. And I know for a lot of my career, and for a lot of people who worked for me and with me, that perception that they had about what other people thought of them was a major limiting factor in their lives. It doesn't need to be. It can be ditched. So at this presentation, I will show you how you can improve how you feel and see yourself by allowing your career goals and values to create more impact and fulfillment in your life. If I achieve part of that, if one or two people in the room hear my message today, then I will be delighted. So here's a little bit of the research that I found and based on my own experiences, I think that were important to me. 
just because you're successful doesn't mean you actually have accomplishments. Most people who reach the top of the career ladder still feel, feel unfulfilled, miserable, and unhappy. There was a survey done in Japan of housing millionaires. They wanted to do it in Ireland, but they couldn't find a housing millionaire. <laughs> and what that survey basically found is that each one of them had a goal beyond what they had already achieved. They weren't content, they weren't happy with what they had at that point in time. Being a millionaire, they would be happy when they were multi-millionaires. <coughs> when they were multi-millionaires, they would be happy when they had a private jet. When they had a private jet, they would be happy when they had a private jet that could fly the Atlantic. So there was always a goal, always something else to aspire to. And they never, or at least, substantially never achieved fulfillment and happiness from, a, from achieving what other people would, would consider enormous success. Of course, for many people, they don't know what success is. And this is usually the same point. But if you don't know what success is, how do you know when you've made it? How do you know when you've achieved it? Of great importance, work-related stress impacts your relationships, your mental and your physical health. And this, I think, I think we've all heard this. We've all heard stories of people who are highly stressed and physically their health broke down and they reached retirement age and they weren't fit to, they weren't fit to continue on. <coughs> with the, the retirement that they had so long looked forward to. <clears throat> and in my own case, my own stresses, my own strains left me with a dodgy heart. So just this year I thought I had to have a sense in. I'm not, I'm in my early 50s, I didn't think I'd need that till I was 70. But there you go, that's stress. It doesn't need to be that way. Another important finding I have is people who have a clear mission and vision of the impact they want to make have in increased their levels of happiness, fulfillment, and contentment significantly. The blue zones, I'm sure some of you have heard of the blue zones, but these are basically areas around the world where they, more, more people live into their, into their 100 year. And more importantly, they live healthily, they live physically, physically well, they're able and capable of living a full life. And these blue zones, well, are, I'm going to walk up the nose so you can, you can see where they are there. And there, there's sort of some of the numbers. So you'll, you'll see in, in um, Belgium, for example, there are 10 centenarians for every 100,000 people. That in <coughs> Sardinia is 16. So it's a, it's, a, it's a substantial number of people <coughs> living healthily into their 100 year and beyond. And what they found about the Blue Zones is, and again, I'm sure this is not new to most of you, it's they eat mostly plants, eat less, have a garden, engage in exercise, family and community come first, and most importantly, they engage in activities that cultivate meaning, purpose, and creativity. So if you want to enjoy your retirement, see your grandchildren grow up, be fit and healthy to 100 and beyond, <coughs> these are the recommendations. There is, I have included on these slides the website. If anybody's interested, they can they can have a look at the Blue Zones website, and more information is available there. But it really is it really is an interesting point. It really is impactful. <coughs> so if you want to live healthily as long as you possibly can, that's what you got to do. And I don't see stress. And 
overworking on that list. Mm -hmm. Unless, of course, that person overworked it, but he would not get out. Um, I just realized I can't spell. So, this is the Japanese concept of Kazai. The Japanese have studied this in great detail. And again, it's very, very similar point. What's important, what allows <coughs> the Japanese have longevity? And it's the usual things. It's the things we look the, the things we love to do, the things we're good at, the things that the community needs. But most importantly in the Japanese concept is can I get paid for it? So the real point here is if you can get paid for doing something that you really love, really enjoy, then you have met your ikigai. Ikigai in Shinsu terms means purpose, it's meaning. And I don't know why the Japanese have such special wisdom in this area, but they do seem to enjoy longevity that that most of us don't in the Western world. Mm -hmm. So here is what I recommend to become the Buddha and the Badass. To become a Buddha in business without stopping being a Badass. And it's so, it's so important to be that Badass. I'm going to talk about some of these tonight, but you'd be probably glad to hear not all of them. But there is a note on them for anybody who is, who is interested. So the first of those things is vision. And that's a clear picture in our mind of where we want to go and what we are consciously trying to create. And that vision, we know what we want to achieve. We can base our decisions on our long-term vision and we can maximize our performance. We are no longer focusing on the focus on what's really important to us. When creating a vision, it's important <coughs> to write it down. I'm sure most of you have vision statements in their company, you know exactly what they think, what the company is vision is and what it's trying to achieve. Create the vision, write it down, communicate it to others so that others have the opportunity to buy into it. And these are the things your personal vision should cover. Fitness, faith, finance, friends and family. The five Fs in Fitful Lambda. So at this stage, I'm just going to take a break from talking. I think it's time for me to take a break. Hopefully you will all pick up notes and some type of the notes is the wheel of life. And that wheel basically sets out certain areas of your life. And I'd like it to, to take a couple of minutes just to scale <coughs> where you feel that part of your life is at now. It's on a scale of one to 10, 10 being completely perfect and one being completely miserable. So, so if anybody hasn't got this, there's probably some I think it's probably some money to do. Some might be some money to Thank you. 
So the purpose of, of this exercise is to identify an aspect of your life where you feel you can improve. So is your life perfect? Is your relationship perfect? Is your career perfect? If not, mark it along the scale where you can just with this. And hopefully by the end of this exercise you will have you will have determined what area of your life you feel needs improvement. And I, I meant to say at the beginning, if anybody has any questions along the way, feel free to interrupt. I don't, uh, I don't do formality. I'm happy to take any questions as we go along. So if you do interrupt. Okay, so I'll assume everybody has done that now. We'll see. We'll refer back to that again in a few minutes. So if you just bear with me a second, I'll, I'll, I'll move on. <coughs> so in creating a vision, what kind of questions should you ask yourselves? And from my research and from my experience, these are the questions. What experiences do I want? How do I need to grow in order to get these experiences? And how then <coughs> can I contribute? So the example that comes to mind here is perhaps you want the exhilaration, the fun, the excitement of doing the bungee jump. But how do you need to grow to get that? You need to grow your courage, you need to, 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 to grow, grow your sense of daring. And when you have that courage, how then can you contribute to the world? How can you bring that courage? And perhaps that by, by getting other people to do it when you jump just like you've done. Yes. Or you can give a CPA presentation. It's something very similar. <laughs> so from your wheel of life exercise, you will hopefully have identified an area that you think you need to grow whether it be relationships, career, your personal sense of, of how, you, how you get from, how, what experiences you want. So the next item we're gonna talk about is values. And this is so important when coming up with a vision and when, when deciding who you want to be. Again, like vision, they help us they help us with, with direction and purpose, like a guiding compass. Whatever is going on in our lives, our values can show us a path forward and help us make better choices. So in a career sense, in a business sense, it's making better choices. If your choices are based on your values, you know that whatever way that choice works out, it's done from a, from a place of value, it's value driven, and you, you can feel much more comfortable with that choice. And values, of course, are so important for our, our mental health. This is another video which is clearly not going to work, 
But essentially <laughs> what this video is saying is values, and we can view them as being good or bad. And the example in this video is love and power, love being good and power being bad. But what this tells us is that love without power is meaningless. It's dangerous. It's it it doesn't achieve anything. So it's a bit like it's the same message as the Buddha and badass. <coughs> Love being the Buddha, or being the badass. One without the other is meaningless. It's, it's not going to help. It's not going to help us. In this case, power being the badass. If you have power without love, then you're gonna do. You're gonna leave a wake of destruction behind you. You're gonna leave a legacy that you would not be be proud of, and you're gonna suffer. So the real message is: when deciding your values, when looking at your values, don't judge a value as being good or bad. The value is your value. It's a personal value, and so long as it's so long as it's your value then it's always good, it's always right. And here's a list of values that, um, and I ask you to have a look at that list. And from that list, pick two values that are important to you. For me, one of those values has always been responsibility. I've always felt responsible for others and I've always felt that I needed to take that responsibility myself. Uh, over, over time, success was a was a value of mine. Um, my values now are compassion, fairness, kindness. So I'll ask you just for the sake of this exercise and the exercise I did today to choose two values that resonate strongly for you that are really important. And on the next page of the handout, you'll have the three and I choose questionnaire. And on the top of that, you'll see a space to write down two values. So I'd invite you to do that now. When you've, when you've selected your values, if you then look at the questionnaire, you'll see I have a column for each of those questions. What experiences do I want? How do I need to grow to get those experiences? And how do I have to do So I'd invite you now to take a couple of minutes to think about each of those and to write down what Based on those based on the values you've identified, what are the key what are the answers to the key most important questions for you?
Anybody willing to share? I have a decent so. <laughs> I will share mine. Um, <coughs> what experiences do I want? For me, the experience I wanted before I made the decision to change my career to leave my job as, as finance director. Drawing on my value of compassion and humanity and being connected to, to people. I wanted the experience of meaning. I wanted to feel that I want that my contribution to the world was meaningful. It was more than just it was more than going to work at eight thirty in the evening or eight thirty in the evening. I was working hard. I was stressed, and I felt as if there was no point to it. Particularly when my daughter died, all the success, all the trappings of wealth that I had built at that stage didn't do me any good. They weren't in line with my values, the value of compassion and connectedness. So I wanted, I wanted to experience that what I was doing was meaningful. How did I need to grow to get those experiences? Well, for one of the first things I had to do was let go of my definition of success. Success was no longer defined by my bank account or by the car that I drove or by the house that I lived in. Success was determined by the relationships that I had, the people that were in my life. And how, how then can I contribute that? Well, hopefully, this exercise this evening is one of one way to to make a contribution. So one of the one of the uh, I went on to talk about values and the importance of selecting values that are important to you. The one value I would suggest that will be of great benefit to people is to make growth a value. If we're not growing, we're stagnant, we're staying in the same place, we're we continue to do the same things, perhaps expecting different outcomes. And I know somebody defined that as insanity. And it is. So make growth a value and sit down, perhaps yearly, perhaps monthly, but however long it feels right for you, and evaluate the growth. And if you evaluate by rate of self-evolution, then that's a measurement. You can apply to how you're growing. If that rate is zero, then there may be problems. You may not get the meaning that I, I know is so valuable to people. I think I refer to in the context of my own life, the book to, I will be happy when I'm mother. I will be happy when I get the promotion. I will be happy when I have a new partner or a child, when I live in a bigger house. I go on more holidays. And of course, I got all of these things when I, then the finances when my career was at the top, I got all of these things, but it didn't make me happy. Happiness is not contingent on an outcome. Happiness is a process. If you can focus on enjoying your everyday struggle, knowing that if it's a if it's a difficult time that you're going through, well, you're growing. If it's a painful time, well, pain is what makes you makes you human. Happiness is not dependent on the outcome. Outcomes that we want may not happen. And if we're waiting for, for those outcomes to, in order to be happy, we may be disappointed. Happiness is a process and it's a process we can adopt, we can decide on right now in this room, right this minute. 
Když pěn některé lesser pen. Když lesser pen yes. It's about deciding that we're going to leave this for, and we're going to bring that less to everything we do to the process rather than the outcome. It's I am happy right now as I am without changing anything. I'm going to go in order to be more happy, but I am happy now. <laughs> <laughs> and the final, the final, final value that I think is of great importance is one of gratitude. And the science behind this is fascinating. If anybody has any time to read about the science of gratitude, there is a lot of research going into it. And what has been found that gratitude increases dopamine levels in the brain and reduces cortisol. Dopamine being the pleasure hormone, cortisol being the stress hormone. Hormone. And the result of that is that we can make much clearer decisions. If we can adopt the um, attitude of gratitude, we are automatically happier, we are automatically in, in a better place. And by adopting uh, an attitude of gratitude, I, just, I don't mean just thinking of one as I'm grateful. If you can remember a time, when something really positive happened in your life and you felt really grateful for it. If you can remember that, visualize it, and experience that gratitude again, then your dopamine levels increase. You get the physical as well as mental benefits from that. So gratitude <coughs> is so important. And just keeping in mind the time, you'll probably notice that I'm going to stop just shortly after eight o'clock, regardless of our ask. So um, <coughs> I want to talk to you about the ability to think positive, positively. And PQ, positive quotient, is that ability. It's a measure of your ability. If you take your positive thoughts divided by your total thoughts, then you come up with a PQ, a positive positivity quotient. And that's the higher that number, the more positive you can be. And why would you want that? Well, it helps us battle the habitual, the habitual repetitive thoughts. We can be the co-creators of our own destiny. We can choose to let go of the pain that's been inflicted upon us. We can forgive let go of blame, and importantly, let go of judgment. So if, so if you don't like somebody, that's fine. But if you, can, if you can refrain from judging people, the person who benefits most from that is you. You're not the person who you're judging, but yourself. You're letting go of that negative thought. And I know Sarah, for, for me, being judgmental was a big part of who I was as a top finance professional. Yeah, in fact, I think I was doing my job called for it quite a lot from, I had to make judgments quickly and all the time. But when we can leave judging people, judging people as being good or bad, and remembering that they are fundamentally human and letting go of that judgment benefits us more than it benefits them. These thoughts, as I said, are habitual. Our brains are often on autopilot and we can't help. So if we can take between that mm -hmm. stimulus and the negative response that we face and we don't face, we have the ability to decide, decide what, how we want to think, and how we want to view that other person. So there is a school of thoughts that positive thinking results in much more positive outcomes. 
I would add to that positive thinking with positive action results in much more positive outcomes. Positive thinking by itself is not going to not going to benefit anybody. So positive thinking is very closely linked with positive action. There has been some, re some research done into positive thinking and its place in the workforce. Um, it's been clearly shown that higher positivity quotient correlates with a better performance. And those employees are seven times more engaged when they work with their friends. So that spirit of camaraderie of working towards the same goal together Makes it mu mu makes it much more it, it has a very high impact on the person's career path, and the final part of it is uh, optimistic salespeople perform fifty five percent better than pessimistic colleagues. So the optimistic salesperson we can we can imagine that they they expect to make the sale. The idea of, of not making the sale is alien to them, so their positivity is that the sale is going to happen. And guess what? It does. It wouldn't happen unless they picked up the phone to make that cold call or knock on the door or whatever they have to do to make the sale. So, impact. How can we make an impact? So, for me, never doubt the power of one person to make a difference. You are that one person. Every person in this room has the power to make a positive difference to their world. It's important that that impact is value driven, which we've spoken about, and that you contribute fiercely. So, this is about the badass. Don't accept no for an answer. When you're trying to make a contribution, get off your ass and do it. Positive, act, positive thoughts about positive actions are meaningless. So do it and do it with passion, do it with conviction. Get a mission, not a career. Again, this is about passion. And there has been some research done that pe people who are highly connected socially have a much better chance of progressing within their career. This study was a study where people were given five euros a day for five days and one group were asked to keep it and one group were asked to give it away. And they were then questioned at the end of each day about how they felt and how they, how they felt they could make an impact. The people who gave away the five euros by the end of day five scored significantly higher than those who kept it. And the reference to that study is at the bottom there if anybody wants to ask Mr. Google about it. So how can we make how can we make an impact? Visibility. And how can we be visible? Well, we have to show up. We have to speak up and take positive action in alignment with the values. So you're not going to be visible if you hide behind the desk all day. You're not going to be visible if you stay at home in your bedroom or stay at home watching Brazil play the World Cup. Your visibility. You're not going to be visible <coughs> if you fail to speak up. If you see something one happening, speak up about it. If you see something that you don't agree with, speak up and take positive action based on what you what you're seeing. <coughs> Credibility. <coughs> Credibility is so important when we're making impact, making impact. And how do we build credibility? Well, if you look at these, they're highlighted the first level of each, and that spells out raving. Set boundaries. And let people know what those boundaries are. And let people know the consequence of crossing those boundaries. 
be reliable. Say what you'll do, and do what you'll say. Be accountable to yourself as much as to others. So when you fail, your rate of self-evolution will have told you that you failed and you need to do something about it. Vault. Don't gossip. Don't share stories that are not yours to share. So if a colleague tells you something about another colleague, take it with a big pinch of salt, but at least don't share it to others. Don't spread that gossip. Integrity. You all know about this. Be honest in your dealings with people. Non-judgmental. We spoke about that. And be generous. Have a positive attitude to how you treat people. Be generous. Be uh, something we spoke about already is gratitude. Be grateful. Be generous in your outlook. When people see those things in the individual, they can't help but be impacted by what contribution they're making and what they have to say. So legacy, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about this. Um, each of us reach a stage in our lives when we consider how we want to be remembered and what we want to be by. And I don't think we have to spend that too much. So I'm just going to spend a few minutes now talking about how I have changed my business and the business that I am already in. So my mission, as I mentioned already, is to make an impact on the physical and emotional well-being of the pe of people within the corporate world by helping those people to connect with their values and dreams. And that's what has driven me to, to come here tonight. So what I do in terms of helping people to do that is mostly is one-to-one -one coaching. I'm also a, a qualified hypnotherapist, and uh, uh, I will use hypnotherapy as a tool within that coaching to go deeper and make sure that the changes that are, are made in your life are permanent and meaningful. So hopefully that will reduce your stress levels and extend your longevity, most importantly, improve your emotional well-being, and elevate your performance. Again, important from a career point of view. Become a better leader, partner, and parent. I think when we reach success in our careers, leadership is so important. And leadership is about leading people. It's not about, well, I guess it is about leading an organization, setting the vision for that. But if an organization isn't about people, then it's failing in its responsibility. So by improving your communications and delegation skills, that will help you include them, improve the performance of the entire team. And all of this, being the Buddha, being the badass, merging the two, will increase your, your profits in your company and in all your overall individual wealth. So again, you will reach peak performance, your motivation will increase, you will improve your family life, become more resilient, and create habits which will permanently up level your life. So it's important for your business, it's important for yourself. Um, some of the clients that I've worked with over the last year, again, this is in your notes, so you all have the opportunity to look at that. And the most recent of these was Egan, who was going through a tough time in our business and was ready to give it up. That has changed. She is now up running her business a bit more 
motivation because she knows the importance of the thing in the video. So what I'm bringing is a unique mix of corporate and the personal development criteria. I'm qualified and accredited. Um, ICF, International Coaching Federation. Uh, RTT is Rapid Transformational Kitchen Therapy and the Association for Coaching. And Evolve is a, a college that I work with with people with mental health issues. And some other things that I do, I have an online training course, uh, mostly it's in addition to that course, is some material on handling stress and anxiety. I have a monthly membership where new courses are added every month, a community and strength cards, which are physically printed cards that allow people to remind themselves of their strengths in times of difficulty when they find themselves struggling to reach their goals to be to have that meaning in their lives. The strength cards can be a can be a valuable addition. And finally, if any of you would like to chat about this, if any of you would like to work with me, the QR code will this one will phone my number directly. And this one will go to my website and you can find out more information. And you can book in a you can book an appointment with me uh, through my website. Then I'd love to work with anybody who feels that they need to add some meaning and some stress reduction to their lives. And that is it, I would say. Thank you very much.